season two, we have taken some of our favorite moments and conversations with our guests and put them all together in one podcast episode. Thank you for all of your support. We will be starting up season three in 2022. Hope you enjoy. It was such a pleasure to have Mark Stevenson from Stevenson Brothers Rocking Horses come on our podcast. On episode 59, Mark gives us a tour of his workshop and tells us many stories, one of which he shares his experience of making a rocking horse for the Queen of England. Can I ask you, what made you so determined, because I'm still stuck on this, he's you know, telling you to pay him, telling you we're coming into the technology, nobody's going to buy rocking horses, and you guys decide Tenacity. Yeah. you're going to do it anyways. Yeah. What, what did you have in your minds that this was going to work? <laughs> yeah. Blind faith. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, okay That's so, how most people start. So what start. we did, we... we um, <laughs> We got, we got a great, a great um, sense of who we were by working with an American fellow uh, in the very early 80s. And he kind of unpeeled all the layers off and, and we got who we were. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and that actually, you know, you can do anything if you set your mind to it. Uh, mm-hmm. 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 I'm sure yes. you know exactly what mm-hmm. I'm talking yes. about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this mm-hmm. one here. Just, yep. mm-hmm. Once you commit to mm-hmm. something... You just, and you don't get put off it no. by people telling That's you right. to not do it. Right. That's right. And you know in your heart it's true yeah. and it's real. Yeah. And you and you just go down that road for us. You know, just keep going. Just yes. keep going. You will fall over at the first fence and the second, but yes. you just pick yourself up yeah. and crack on. Yes. And we had lots of people. I mean, we had proper jobs and we gave up proper jobs and moved from London to the wow. country. And people said, what? <laughs> You're going to make rocking horses? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I was, you know, I'd been trained as an I was arty, farty, you know, did stuff at art school and uh, I did a graphic design degree. So I knew a little bit about, you know, making images work and typography and stuff. And my twin brother was good at, good at sculpture. And we just had enough of a, of a faith in ourselves and our sister with horses and hmm. Uncle James going, yeah, that we just thought, well, if we don't do it, we always thought we'd be fun to make a family business, just like you guys. Yeah. Have, you know. Yeah. Um, so I've never managed to work for anyone else. Um, mm-hmm. I set up a design practice in Bristol, Proctor and Stevenson, which is now massive. Mm-hmm. Um, they design incredible stuff, actually. And dear Roger, you know my my old partner, I'm thrilled and proud of him. Uh-uh. He's got all sorts of business accolades after his name now, and doing a great job and with the students that we were we were teaching students as soon as we left college. You know, straight mm-hmm. straight back uh, lecturing. But it's just, I think, to answer your question, just blind faith. Mm-hmm. We had so much fun talking with Samantha Smith and Mary Courtney Gavini. Both of them work on the marketing team at the headquarters of Pony Club. Listen as we talk about some of the opportunities Pony Club offers. Check out episode 84 for the full conversation. The fun side from like either there's, I, I understood, I thought that it was for kids, but it's all ages now. So the fun side of Pony Club is there's so much to it. So I, I could be wrong, but I just wanted, you know, either if you don't have a horse if you're thinking of getting a horse, tell us how that works for so that the person that doesn't know about Pony Club, what it offers to somebody mm-hmm. if they're interested in getting involved or their children or themselves. So Pony Club is an educational organization and we focus on like the foundations of riding and horsemanship. So, you know, we have different disciplines and like mm. different competitive disciplines mm-hmm. and then different resource disciplines. And within our competitive disciplines, there's a horse management facet to it. And then you can also compete in quiz. So there are definitely opportunities. If you don't have a horse, okay. there are opportunities for people to, you know, borrow horses as well. Mm. And um, there are different like rank certification levels and so they can get certified in different disciplines at different Mm -hmm. levels they can also get certified in horse management at different levels Mm -hmm. um and so you can get involved as a kid as an adult um you could participate as an adult you can volunteer and be a leader um Mm -hmm. there are just so many ways to get involved in the organization Mm -hmm. in general with and the, the disciplines, I thought I was I wasn't aware that there were like what different disciplines do you 
like uh, help people with? I mean, just everything or, you know? So there's resource disciplines, which um, we have like, we provide opportunities and um, some like instructional, like depending on what club or center you're in, um, they can, you can learn about different disciplines and those resource disciplines involve things that we don't provide rule books for or competition in. Mm -hmm. Um, So like vaulting would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for the like competitive ones, we provide rule books and there's actual like rules to how you compete and Mm -hmm. you can qualify for our championships. And so those disciplines, and there's a lot of them, um, include horse management, dressage, eventing, games, gymkhana, polo cross, Hmm. quiz, show jumping, tetrathlon, uh, western dressage, and western trail. So those are the ones that we have competitive. And then like vaulting, polo, driving, um, fox hunting, those are all Mm. like the resource activities that... Mm you can still learn about, but we don't have like set rule books. Um, Mm -hmm. and we don't have those at championships, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So these, um, your pony clubs are, are basically, are there, are they started? Like, you know, would you have someone come to you and say, I'd like to start a pony club and then does someone come and help them or how does that work then? Yeah. So there's like, there's, um, clubs and centers throughout all of the U S. And so the difference, there's, either a club or a center. So the difference is a club is uh, basically a volunteer group of parents and leaders that organize it. And then a center is an actual business. So like if there's already a established riding facility that teaches lessons, um, you can apply to pony club to have the pony club program taught. And then Mm. you would be, but you're still your business too. And you have that that would be a riding center versus Mm -hmm. a club would be uh, all volunteer based. Whereas like the center, the leaders are, it would be within that business. They can still pay their like, Mm. you know, instructors, everything, the leaders for the clubs, they're not paid, they're volunteers. And parents are really, really involved in the clubs within Mm -hmm. the centers. Parents are encouraged to be involved, but I think at the club level, it's, um, it's much more you know, volunteer wow. based. So. I had no idea. That's really, you know, it gives everybody an opportunity, everybody a chance. Right. So, Up next, we have Ansley Bevan, an equine massage therapist. Ansley is a good friend of ours, and she shares the importance of regularly checking your horses for soreness and potential problem spots. Ansley released an equine stretching and strengthening guide that can be found on her website, www.abequinetherapy.com. Ansley shares so many more tips and tricks in episode 80. When you see your horse starting to do these things, that might be the time to start to look for someone like you because sometimes people think their horses are being not listening, but yeah. actually there's a problem, you know? So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's funny that you bring that up because that is actually a huge part of what I do. Um, and that's sort of like I won't, I don't want to use the word stigma, but uh-huh. I mean, we all know as horse people, a lot of the times um, in our society, as part of our culture, we will write off behavioral issues right. as just that. It's right. a behavioral issue. Right. The horse is girthy. The horse, you know, oh, they they buck because, you right. know, they don't like moving forward right. or they don't feel like working today or they're right. hot or, you right. know, whatever. Oh, they're, they're barn sour because all their friends are there. You know, yes. we make excuses. We've made mm-hmm. all these reasons of why the horse is doing something right. when in reality, it's like, okay, well, when's the last time you had your saddle checked? Does your Mm -hmm. saddle fit correctly? Is your horse, you know, back sore because of that? When's the last time you palpated through the apaxial muscles? I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. those are the types of of signs you need to look out for um, and the behaviors. I mean, it's like, if you've got a horse that's turning around, pitting their ears, trying to bite you when you're tacking up, that's probably a pain response. Mm -hmm. And that's probably when you need to get a body worker involved because, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not just, oh, the horse doesn't want to work today. I mean, yes, we all have good and bad days and maybe they'll feel better one day and they will the other. That's all part of it. Um, But it's definitely, it comes down to you opening your eyes as a rider and a horse owner and really looking at those behaviors and trying to get to the bottom of it. So I would say, I mean, to kind of answer your question, it's a kind of, it's a passionate topic of mine. Oh, well, you good. Yeah. That's good. We want to hear about it because <laughs> but, I think it's important too for people mm-hmm. to know, you know, yeah. we don't know sometimes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so I think definitely anything that, if the horse is giving you any kind of indication that they're uncomfortable or something that you're thinking, okay, this behavior is not right. kind of a nice, even um, reaction. Right. I mean, I would look into look into it being a pain response and really palpate, put your hands on the horse. Um, get if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself, and obviously get get a body worker out there to kind of mm -hmm. assess the situation um, because the horse in nature, I mean, they, they're very, you know, kind of go with the flow creatures. Right. I, they're, they're nice. They're gentle. Right. That's sort of right. who they want to be. They're right. not out to get you. Right. They're not right. these angry, right. you know, animals, unless they've been given a reason yeah. to be. Right. So, so well, like, kind of even with my own horses, like if there's a problem, a leg problem, you run your hands down their legs, you know, and you, you just feel, you know, and if they start to pull their leg up, you know, ah, here's a spot, you know, and you don't want to press too hard. But this is kind of maybe a funny question, but let's just say, you know, is there anything that you tell like people to check like down their back with their fingers or anything that's a good place to check? Because, you know, we check legs and things like that. But is there another place that maybe we miss that we should be checking to see if it's sore or tender and how much pressure should we use if we're checking? Yeah. You know? So I would say um, I'll, I'll describe it as best I can. I mean, it's obviously sure. easier if you can do it in person and kind of right. check, give a visual. But um, I'd say the number one place you want to be checking is the back mm -hmm. um, because that's where you're going to get, I'd say 90% of the horses I work on are back sore. Mm -hmm. So whether that's due to, you know, an anatomical issue like kissing spine that somebody mm -hmm. hasn't found, whether it's mm -hmm. due to a saddle doesn't fit because yes. they just haven't gotten a check, mm -hmm. or if it's just, you know, the horse is in work or they had a heavy jump school, maybe they're a yes. little bit tender. Um, I mean, the horse, I would say that's the number one place. And okay. you just want to run your hand along the horse's back and, and you're just doing a little palpation. Okay. Um, I see a lot of people that will do like a fingernail mm -hmm. and you don't want to do that. Yes. I, I don't recommend doing it that way because you're just eliciting like a very ticklish reaction and the horse, you know, 99% yeah. of the time is going to arch their back and shy away from you because that's a ticklish thing, you mm -hmm. know, it's just right. like a person and somebody right. kind of tickles you, you're going to be like very right. reactive to it. So, I mean, there is a, there is a way to do it. Um, to palpate correctly but I mean that's something I normally show my clients in person it's not a ton of pressure you're just kind of going along the back and you want to press gently and see if you know a horse that's extremely back sore it's really not going to take much at all for okay. you to see that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so okay. you're in Florida we're in Ohio and we have we have a horse that you know needs this how do we know who to choose and how do we know even after choosing that person that this is a good uh, fit for both of us. <laughs> yeah. So that can be, that can definitely be tricky. Um, you know, I do personally, I'm a very researchy kind of person. So I'll really look, I'll see if, do they have a website? Do they have a Facebook? Do they have a social media page? Do they have something that I can look into and kind of assess their background on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of the old school therapists that have been in the game for a long time, they don't have that. Um, because they're older, it's not really their thing, social mm -hmm. media platforms. And also they already have established clientele, so they don't really need it because their whole yeah. service base is, is word of mouth. So, so that's one thing. But um, if you're going to use somebody that doesn't have any type of um, for lack of a better term, proof or legitimacy, like if you ask them, hey, you know, what modalities do you use or where did you go to school or how long have you been doing this? I mean, those types of questions are going to be your baseline, I think, um, for weeding out maybe somebody that isn't that great. In this clip, Melissa Hubbard, CEO of Carrots, shares her experience of doing a 360 review and how she had to learn to communicate differently to better her team. To hear more, listen to episode 85. Um, and But I will say, growing my career at that time, um, that kind of feedback was incredibly valuable to me mm -hmm. um, as a leader because it taught me that a lot, it taught me a lot of things. But one of the main things it taught me was that I thought I was a very good communicator and the people around me did not agree with that. Hmm. And so I was like, all right, 
you're going to need to get better at this. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't necessarily because I wasn't providing the information. It was that I wasn't providing it in a way that each of those individual people could absorb it and use it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to really sort of dial in and tune into um, what different styles of communication, different members of my team needed in order for it to be effective for them. Um, So that was super insightful. Um, And then one of the other things that I learned is that people needed more from me. And it was at a time when I thought I was giving 150% of myself Hmm. and was, but I was giving 150% of myself to a lot of different people. And so each of those individual people were not feeling it. (laughs) So um, I had to figure out how to be better at that too. So, um, you know, sort of to circle back to your question, I think, you know, a lot of it is just, it's in your DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, a lot of it is being given the opportunity to have learning experiences like a 360 review. Um, And the result of that review wasn't the different skill set that I needed. Like I had the skill set. It was Mm -hmm. just learning how to fine tune the tools that I had so that they were more effective. Um, So were there any tools that you were able to use to help you with that? Or did you just try to focus on the people themselves or how did you figure that out because changing your communication style is very hard yeah <laughs> so like it is Gretchen and I don't laughing. know that I yeah I, well and I didn't ch- I mean you can't you can't change who you are right, right. So I didn't necessarily change my communication style I just used it I, mean, I communicate I over communicated I would say So my preferred mode of communication is email because it gives me time to think and Mm -hmm. process and like, it's all clear (laughs) in my head on, in an email, Mm -hmm. it's all clear, but sometimes people want to hear you speak the words. Yeah. So a lot of times what I would do is say for a team meeting, I would email out an agenda um, and I would put some talking points into that email for each agenda item. And then we would go into the meeting and then I would then talk them through all of those things in person. And so for the people who wanted to read, they had it in the email. And for okay. the people who really just wanted to listen, they could have the discussion during the staff meeting. But the two of those things together really worked great because, you know, we're all bombarded by a million different things these days, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to see something five, six, seven, yes. ten times before you really digest it. So it ended up being a great way for people to like see it twice yeah. and have more of an opportunity to, to absorb mm-hmm. um, and move forward. But yeah, like the worst thing ever is when you feel like you have communicated really well and your whole team is like, I have no idea. Hmm. <laughs> what you are saying and what you are talking about. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) I I had done such a good job at this. Um, You know, that's kind of extreme. It wasn't really that extreme, but, um, but it probably felt like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It did feel like it. And it did. And, you know, for me, like I'm inherently a kind person and I want to take care of my team and take care of my people. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like I was taking very good care of them. Mm -hmm. And some of them didn't feel like I was. Hmm. And so, you know, from that perspective, it was really difficult for me. Um, and I could, it was anonymous, but I could kind of tell by the comments, mm-hmm. some of the, who, who it was. And so it did allow me to have conversations with those people. And, you know, having difficult conversations is a thing that um, we talk about as lot, a lot as leaders and managers, right? Like, how mm-hmm. do you have a conversation and how do you coach your junior team members into how to have a difficult conversation and I just had to be like come in a conference room with me we need to have a conversation and I just would sit down at the table with them and be like listen this is not going to be fun and this is going to be terribly awkward um but here's how I think you're feeling and here's what my intention was Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and I you know I like to say there's there's my my perception there's the other person's perception and then there's like the reality is somewhere Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of that. So um, it's always, always challenging. So then the other point that you made too, was that you thought you were giving 150%. People weren't feeling that same way. 
you could take that to any aspect of your life as a mom, as a like, as even horse riders that you're giving all of this and then you have no time left to even get on the horse because you're so tired type of a thing. How did you uh, work through that to make that better for everybody and yourself? So I, um, I had to get to a place where I was comfortable with the fact that I couldn't do it all myself. And delegating things was very difficult for me because I really loved all of the components of my job. And mm -hmm. that sounds so hokey, right? Because there's, there's nobody mm -hmm. loves everything about their job, mm -hmm. but I really other maybe others maybe than pricing supplements <laughs> <laughs> part of what I did at smart pack I really loved um and so I started delegating some of that stuff when I kind of got to a place where I was comfortable with the fact that I couldn't do it all and the feedback that I got um was you don't care anymore because you're not coming to these meetings and you're not involved mm. and my intention was I can't do it all and I need to grow this team and I need to give them responsibilities and let them do it rather than me doing it. And that's what I was trying to do, give them opportunities and help them grow. Mm -hmm. And their perception was I didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. So I just had to be careful from, well, from then on, I was like, okay, so you know what? I need to better explain why I'm handing over some of these responsibilities and why I'm not going to these meetings and people then will understand. Um, I had uh, oftentimes life was really crazy and busy and I had staff meetings with my team that we talked about earlier and sometimes I would reschedule them and that really upset people mm -hmm. because it felt like they weren't important and I wasn't making time for them. Mm -hmm. So I had to make sure that I didn't reschedule that meeting ever again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, never again did we reschedule that meeting. Other things moved, but for yeah. my team, they were priority and, they, and, and good on them for raising their hand and saying, mm -hmm. we need to be your priority. Um, so yeah, so it was a lot about letting go and making sure that people understood why I was letting go of certain things. Um, and in my personal life and for my child, God love my child, he's 15 now. And he, when he was born, I was like, I don't, he's got two legs, not four. What do I do with it? <laughs> Seriously, how do I keep this? How do I keep this creature alive? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I went back to work when he was 10 weeks old and I was traveling a lot when he oh, was an infant. Wow. And so yeah. I had a lot of help at home and thankfully he doesn't remember that I wasn't there a lot because it would make me sad if he felt like I wasn't there for him. Um, but I did have to get to a place where I said no mm -hmm. for him. Like I had, I had to be his mom. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons ultimately that I left smart pack was because of him, because he needed more of my time and attention. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had this team that was fully capable of doing what they needed to do. And I needed to craft my life in such a way that I could be more available for Logan. So, um, that is one of the reasons. So, you can't do it all. Mm -hmm. And all these like, you know, lean in <laughs> these lean in conversations and be superwoman. You can't, you just, it's not sustainable and you have to be able to take care of yourself. And leaning in means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Right. And I certainly, I certainly have had a very big and successful career and I don't feel like I've missed out on anything at all. Um, and I do feel like taking care of myself has been the thing that has helped to make it even more successful. You have to take time. Mm -hmm. You have to yeah. take time to take care of yourself. You have to take time to be with your family. Um, and for those of us who use horses as therapy, mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to take time. I ride five days a week. Wow. Good for you. I ride five days a week. My horse is 10 minutes from my house. And so I make sure that I can get there for that um, physical exercise and mm -hmm. also for the mental yeah. exercise. Um, As always, we are ending this episode with a canter banter story. Andrea Zolkowski has us laughing so hard during this episode. She shares her life as a wrangler and the many adventures it brings. You won't want to miss episode 69. In Wyoming, it was my first season there and we had a herd of about 50 horses. And the night before they had delivered um, six new ones. Now, 
when our corral was located in a different place than our pasture. And so they just grazed, they just grazed all night. That's, that's how they ate. Mm -hmm. And every morning we, two wranglers would ride out and they would push the herd in, into the corral. And when they were pushing, the reason you needed two was somebody had to be in the front Mm -hmm. and someone had to be in the back because there was no fencing to keep these horses in. And they had free range. They could go up the, up the ski mountain into the neighborhoods. They could go out onto the highway, but normally they would follow the person in front. So things got Western pretty quick sometimes when they would take off running. Mm -hmm. Um, So one morning, this was the morning after we got six new ones in and they didn't know our routine. And so sure enough, they decided to take off up, up the ski mountain into the neighborhoods and we lost six of them. Mm -hmm. No, no, we lost eight of them total. So eight horses are now missing and we're trying to find them (laughs) scrambling around, running up the mountain and we can't find them. So we're like, okay, we have these other horses. Uh, We need to get them saddled because we have guests coming to ride in one hour. So we go back down and we, we, we saddle up the rest of the horses and we send our first ride out. Now, sometimes people overestimate their ability and sometimes <laughs> no business being on a horse, um, but we send everybody. We try to accommodate all. So the first ride went out. The rest of us, two horses had came back into the pasture. So we rode out and we're trying to gather up these two and they're running around like crazy and we're just trying to get them. And then all of a sudden I get a call and, and it's from the wrangler that took the ride out. And she's like, hey someone fell off. I need you up here now. And I was the closest one. And I was the only one that had a med kit. So I take off running and I was riding cowboy. Thank God for this. I was riding my (laughs) horse cowboy. who's amazing. Does anything ask this horse to do. And we're running, we're hauling. I mean, we're going really fast trying to run up. I knew exactly where they were. They were up on our switchback trail. And so I'm running up to get to them because I didn't know how hurt they were. And all of a sudden I get to the fork in the trail where I had to go right just before that fork, there is a mama bear and her cub. And I immediately slowed my horse down and I started yelling, you know, you got to yell, wave your arms, act big. And normally a black bear who this is, that's what this was. They normally will leave you alone and they'll run away. They're very kind of, they're kind of docile. They don't really care about people, but she had her baby with her. I mean, and this was, this was a, you know, couple month old baby. So she was very protective and the little baby cub, it ran off to the left. And I was like, great. Mom's going to follow. Mom did not follow oh. mom. Ended up, and it happened so fast. I was probably 15 feet away from this bear. And all of a sudden she stood up on her hind legs and she growled at me. Oh my goodness. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever had a bear scream at you, uh-uh. but it's terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. So in my head, I made a split second decision. I could either run from the bear and oh. kick in its prey drive, and then it could chase after me. And bears are just as fast as horses, by the way. Oh wow! Or I could charge the bear and hope it backs down. And I was like, okay, Jesus, yeah. take the reins. Let's get, yes. this, let's get this cowboy. So, you know, I take my rein and I whack cowboy on the butt and, and start screaming. And I don't know if cowboy thought this was a cow or what, but his ears were pinned. His mouth was open, ready to bite this bear and he just charged right after it. And I got so close to this bear. If I had just reached down, like by my stirrup, I could have touched this bear. I mean, we basically body checked it and luckily she did back down and ran off. So there was that. And I kept, I continued running up to the people, finally got to them. The lady, she had just, her saddle slipped and she fell off and she said her tailbone hurt and she didn't want to get back on her horse. So normally in that situation, the Wrangler will get, I would get off my horse and walk with her back to the corral. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, also, by the way, there is a bear down there with her cubs. So I'm not getting off my horse. You can walk behind me. The ride continued on with the other Wrangler ponying her horse. And, you know, we started walking down and the ride got farther ahead of us because, you know, they're on horses Mm -hmm. and we hear them in the distance screaming because we're in the woods and echoes. We hear them screaming because the bear had come back. Oh no. But she had like eight people on her ride and they were all on horses. So (laughs) the bear, the bear ran away. So it was fine. This lady 
she's like, oh my God, what's that screaming? I was like, well, that's probably the bear that I told you about. <laughs> didn't want to work the horse, so now you have to walk. And she's like, well, can I get on your horse with you? And I was like, no. So, that's not how this works. <laughs> no. Um, so we got her back to the corral, safe and sound. She was fine. And then we get a call from the mountain, the ski mountain. And they're like, hey, we found your horses. They're up at 9,000 feet. Come get them. Oh, my goodness. So, and mind you, this is all before 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> my boss is like, Andrea, you're coming with me to get these horses. So we have a driver. We have six halters. Mm-hmm. And we get up and we, we find the horses. Sure enough, they are at 9,000 feet. The peak of this mountain was 10,500. Oh so gosh. they almost made it up. They went from six. <laughs> To 9,000 feet. I mean, they were on a mission to get. Away. So um, we halter them. And when we're done haltering them, I look behind me and the truck is gone. And I look at my boss and I was like, so the truck's gone. What do we do now? Oh. He's like, oh, just get the horse and get on. And I'm like, Chad, you just bought these horses. Okay, there's one. You're, they're new. You don't know them. Two, you want me to jump on a horse bareback that you don't know in a halter. At He's like, yeah. feet. <laughs> and then also I have to pony two of them mm-hmm. and I'm like okay I'll do it I find a rock and I jump on the smallest one because I figure when I fall off yeah I will have less you know room to travel to the mm-hmm. ground <laughs> so I'm on I'm on this brand new horse that he doesn't know bareback in a halter ponying two other so here we are on, um, I'm on, I'm on this horse bareback that he just bought. He doesn't know riding it again, bareback with just a halter ponying two other horses that he also doesn't know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, again, I picked the smallest one because I figured it was less of, you know, a fall when right. I, when I fall. And so we're riding along, we're going down the mountain and Jackson hole in Teton village, the ski mountain, there's very steep. I mean, it's one of the steepest people come from all around the world to ski mm-hmm. there but because it's so steep. So we're, we're going along just fine at a walk. And then he looks down at his watch and he's like, Oh crap, we got to go. And I'm like, uh, what, what do you, what do you mean? We have to go. He says, well, you have a ride to take out in 20 minutes and we need you down at the corral. Now we got to yes. go. So, Next thing I know, we are loping down this mountain on horse bareback with a halter, ponying two others that we have no idea if these are safe, sound horses. Um, And I really thought that that was the day I was going to die. But (laughs) as we're loping along, um, Jesus take the reins. Everything was fine. (laughs) That's the second second moment in this one day that I said that you need to take the reins because I was really questioning if I was going to survive the day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We made it back down the mountain just fine. The horses were amazing. I could not wait for two strangers to do this to them. Um, We made it back down. My horse was saddled for me and... I went on a ride and then had lots to talk about. The rest of the- <laughs> wow. What a day. <laughs> and the eight people were fine too. What was that? The eight people were fine too after their experience then. On the- oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were still ready to go. I was like, yeah, there's a bear around here with a baby that I ran into. And they're like, where? I want to see. I'm like, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. That was a funny day. Um, just day, in the life. day in the life. Oh. Yeah. I don't think we've ever heard a story like that no. before. <laughs> so. We hope you enjoyed listening to our podcast and encourage you to share with all of your equestrian family and friends. You can tune into the Late Night Writers podcast show every Friday night. Each episode will be uploaded exclusively to YouTube where you can subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of our latest shows. Do you have a topic you'd like us to discuss? We want to hear from you. You may email us at podcast at or feel free to leave a comment below. Thank you again for listening.